Hello everyone, my name is Ashla and I am pleased to welcome you to the Glass House Lecture Series to explore fashion as a critical discourse. The aim of this series is to critically consider fashion from multiple perspectives, bringing these conversations outside of the bounds of traditional institutions and instead to all of us here in a free open discourse. Our hope is that this series can hold many viewpoints through which we examine fashion and to embody the way that fashion is formed through shared relationships and spaces, valuing the intersections of difference as a key to dialogue. Often in popular writing on the subject and its theory, fashion is spoken about as a field that directly reflects culture. We hope to reframe this viewpoint, instead exploring the multitude of ways that fashion creates and shapes culture. This is important because it recasts fashion as a medium through which we have agency, and also highlights the ways that fashion has helped to produce our cultural, social, and political realities. Our hope is that these lectures will open ideas and questions for you, and that you will continue to build on these discussions in your lives, communities, and ways of being in the world. Today, we are happy to be joined by Dr. Jonathan Michael Square, who will present his lecture, The Myth of the Tignon and the Invention of New Orleans. Dr. Square is an assistant professor at Parsons School of Design. He earned his PhD from New York University, his MA from the University of Texas at Austin, and BA from Cornell University. Previously, he taught at the Committee on Degree in History and Literature at Harvard University, and was a fellow at the Costume Institute at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Recently, Dr. Square curated the exhibition, Past is Present, Black Artists Respond to the Complicated Histories of Slavery at the Heron School of Art and Design, which closed in January of 2023. He is currently preparing for his upcoming exhibition titled African American Picture Gallery at the Winter Arthur Museum, Garden and Library. Dr. Square also leads the Digital Humanities Project, Fashioning the Self in Slavery and Freedom, which explores the intersections of fashion and slavery through online platforms. In his work and research, Dr. Square is unbound by medium, working in the intersections of design, history, theory, and across digital realms. Dr. Square's research highlights and uncovers fashion histories of African diasporic cultures and the role of slavery, racism, and subjugation in the production of fashion in the United States. Particularly, Dr. Square's work shows the ways that African American cultures have employed fashion as a discourse of agency, liberation, and freedom. Today, Dr. Square explores the history of the Tignon head wrap, its role in defining the unique history of Louisiana, and its relationship to race, geography, and cultural migration. We invite you to join us in warmly welcoming Dr. Square to the Glasshouse Lecture Series as we explore the complexities of fashion together. Today's lecture will be about 40 minutes. If you would like to receive notifications about upcoming lectures or view previous ones, please visit welcometotheglasshouse.com and enter your email in our contact page. Dr. Square, I will let you take it from here. Hi, um, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, I must start off by thanking Brooke for inviting me to, to present my research at the Glass House. Um, this is very exciting for me. It's always a pleasure to share my insights uh, with the new audience. So I look forward to getting any questions or any um, um, concepts or insights that you might have um, as it relates to my research. So I'm just gonna jump right in to my lecture. Let me share my screen. So um, the title of today's lecture is The Myth of the Tignon and the Invention of New Orleans. And it's actually a chapter from my current book manuscript, which will be published by Duke University. Um, the book is doing a lot of things. Um, this is just one chapter amongst five different chapters. There's a chapter on Negro cloth, which is the book's namesake which is a textile that was manufactured specifically for, for enslaved people. And in that chapter, I look at Negro cloth from the perspective of enslaved people using um, slave narratives and testimonies um, from enslaved people. The second chapter is um, what I'll present today. There's also another chapter on a Black trans sex worker in early 19th century New York City. And I used um, newspaper accounts and court cases uh, to explore how fashion um, shaped her identity. There's also a chapter on the company Brooks Brothers, which many do not know manufactured clothing that ended up on the backs of enslaved people. 
And the fourth chapter is on W.E.B. Du Bois, um, the important civil rights leader and intellectual. And I explore his style evolution um, using photography. So that's the book in a nutshell. But today I'm going to present the second chapter, which is on head wraps worn by free and enslaved women of color in southern Louisiana, particularly New Orleans. So here's my research problem. In the second chapter, which I'll present today, I outline the history of head wraps worn by free and enslaved women in South Louisiana. Explore how these head wraps are remembered in the popular imagination, and in the process, problematize the scholarship on the tenure. Scholarship on Louisiana's unique history has served as an endless point of inspiration for artistic and scholarly productions, but much of these works are shoddy or simply inaccurate. This chapter is thus a corrective to what I call the myth of the tenure. So let's just talk about the tenure for a second. Um, this is a, a Webster dictionary definition of tenure. Um, it's essentially a head wrap, a kerchief, often made out of matras. And it, it's used to describe the head wrap, particularly worn in Southern Louisiana. Um, one thing that I do in the chapters is really unpack the etymology of tenyo. It's it's re it's related probably to shinyo, which is a word to describe like a low bun in the back of a woman's head. Um, it's, also, it's a word that um, in my research didn't begin to be used until the late 19th, early 20th century. So one curious thing is that my research focuses on the late 18th century, but the, the word tenyon wasn't really used in the late 18th century, early 19th century Louisiana. It's not a word you really start seeing being used until the, the end of the 19th century. And I'll go more into why that is later in the presentation, but it's just something to keep in mind. I included this slide just as a reminder that Louisiana, um, which is the ge geographical focus of my research, at least in this chapter, um, is often thought of as being part of the Francophone world historically. And it's absolutely true, but people often forget that Louisiana was also a Spanish colony. And in this map, you can see um, Spanish Louisiana, um, which is the, the focus of my research. The, the, the Tenyon Law, which I'll talk about later, was passed when Louisiana was still under the control of the Spanish colonial authorities. So this slide is about the Tenyon Law that I just referenced. Um, Esteban Mido, who was the governor of Spanish Louisiana, enacted a bando de buen gobierno, which could be translated to an edict of good governance, on June 1st, 1786, in an attempt to establish control over New Orleans, whose population was comprised of poor whites, native people, and free and enslaved people of African descent. The sixth clause ordered free and enslaved women not to wear feathers or curls in their hair, presumably to temper their penchant for what they felt were ostentatious hairstyles. So this edict, which was passed in 1786, had 34 clauses under it. There was a clause that sort of mandated a curfew, uh, a clause that said you couldn't rent properties to people of African descent or native people. There was a lot going on in this edict, but people really zero in on the sixth clause, which um, is often referred to as um, the tenure clause or the tenure law. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, in 1786, Louisiana was under Spanish control. And in the actual language of the law, the word tenyo is not used. Um, tenyelo, which is the Spanish word for handkerchief or hit, kerchief or head wrap, is used. So this is a scan of this bundle de buen gobierno, this edict. Um, as you see, it's not the best scan, so I transcribed it. Um, as you can see, it's written in Spanish because um, 
mostly put documents during this period were written in Spanish because Louisiana was under Spanish control. This is my translation of the sixth clause. The distinction that exists in the hairstyles that color peoples from others is gradually losing usefulness as it is. I ordered that black mulatto and quadrant women and that wear feathers or curls in their hair and must wear it flat or with a handkerchief when their hair is as high as they're used to wearing it. So the stipulation against women of color wearing their hair high and uncovered was ultimately ineffective. Think about it. Most sumptuary laws are ineffective. It's really hard to control how people, what people do with their bodies and how they style it. Um, Midos Edict tells us more about Spanish authorities' anxieties regarding Black women's dress and where they believe their power lied. So often, a lot of the scholarship on Atenyal hypothesizes or argues that Black women were wearing head wraps because it was stipulated in Spanish colonial law. What I argue in this chapter is that Black women were wearing head wraps because, one, it was part of a longer Afro-diasporic tradition that went all the, back, all the way back to pre-colonial Africa. And Black women's fashion was shaping the law. It wasn't the law that was shaping Black women's fashion. Um, so to make this argument, um, I identify the most efficient sources for understanding how Black women adorned themselves, chose to present themselves to the world, and wanted to be memorialized. And so I use contemporary representations of these women, which is portraits that they commissioned of themselves, most of them in the early 19th century. There's one in, from the late 18th century too. But before I go into my analysis of these portraits, I wanna just talk about um, an inspiration for this research. I'm really inspired by the work of a curator named Denise Morel who curated an exhibition um, at the end of 2018 and the beginning of 2019 called Posing Modernity. And it was all about um, Black women as muses of French intellectuals in the late 19th century. And the exhibition was mounted at Wallach Gallery at Columbia University, but it also traveled to the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, a uh, very groundbreaking exhibition. Um, now, um, Denise Morel is an associate curator at the Met. Uh, what's really important about this exhibition is that when people think about Manet or Matisse or Baudelaire, they may not realize that there were Black women that were part of their social circle and influencing their aesthetic. So here's an example. One of the first examples that Denise Morel uncovers is the identity of this woman. Um, her name was Madeline, and she was actually worked as a domestic in the brother-in-law of the of the the artist's brother-in-law. Um, and so through her research, she was able to uncover her identity. Um, so the current name of this work is Portrait of a Black Woman, but the name is in the process of being changed at the Louvre to reflect the, the true identity of the sitter. This is another artwork that Denise Morel analyzes in her research. Um, this is, you've probably seen this artwork before. It's by Edouard Mormonet. Um, the title of it is Olympia. And Olympia refers to the nude white odalisque. Um, but Denise Morel focuses her analysis on um, the Black female servant to the right. And in Morel's research, she was able to uncover the identity of this woman. Her name is Loire, L-A-U-R-E, Loire. And she actually appears in several Edouard, Edouard Manet works and other artists, French artists from the late 19th century also used her as a model. Um, and so this is the kind of research that's really inspiring 
my own research because I focus on portraits of Black women and I attempt to uncover their life stories and identities in my analysis. Before I do a deep dive into my particular research, I want to show you another work of art that really provides more context um, for what I'm trying to do in this chapter. This is by um, Augustino Brunius, um, an important chronicler of life in the Caribbean in the late 18th century. And this is a linen market in Dominica. Then the reason I included this artwork in my presentation is because a lot of the dress practices that you see here, um, you see throughout the Caribbean and even in the American South, or in my case, South Louisiana. So, I mean, the first thing that I want to bring your attention to is the color white. As you can see, most of the women in this painting are wearing white. I'm not gonna focus on that so much in today's presentation, but in the chapter I go into um, a, the trend for brilliantly white fabrics um, in metropolitan France in the early 19th century. And I argue that they were inspired by the way that women in West Africa and the Caribbean were dressing. So the importance of the color white, another element that's really important is this textile madras that you see many, many of the head wraps and many of the shawls are made out of. That's a really important element. Another important element is the color red, um, which after white, um, is and blue is a very prominent color um, in many of the women's outfits. Um, I've noticed that in the Caribbean, red was a color that was associated with luxury um, and self present, um, ostentatious self presentation. I also speculate that it's tied to Afro diasporic spiritual beliefs. So that's an important element. And it's something that you're going to see in later portraits that I'm going to show you. It's the color red. Another important element is um, jewelry. Um, in a lot of the portraits, you see sort of outfits accessorized with um, precious metals. And you can see it in a lot of the other women's outfits, like in this necklace or um, and earrings, so copious um, metallic jewelry. Another element um, I want to show you how to bring to your attention is um, these sort of off the shoulder, what we might call peasant blouses. Um, it's another element that you see throughout the American South and the Caribbean, and even sometimes in West Africa, um, an exposed decolletage or shoulder. One last thing I want to bring to your attention, sorry, I'm spending a lot of time on this, this, this painting, but it's really important. It's really rich. There are a lot of important details in it, but the head wraps, I mean, th that's what's central to my research, but I'm most interested in is, is their head wraps. And in particular, the way the head wraps are tied, because head, wrap, head wraps aren't unique to African and Afro diasporic cultures. They're pretty ubiquitous throughout Europe, um, in the Western Hemisphere, throughout Asia. You see people wearing various forms of head wraps um, or as fashion items, but also out of religious observance. Um, for me, there are a few distinguishing factors of Afro diasporic head wrapping. Um, one, it's less about modesty and more about ostentation. So it's not necessarily about covering your hair. It's more so about accentuating your hair. So if you look, many of the women's hair is not actually covered. It's sort of peeking out the sides of the head wrap. And again, another thing is that it's, it's about ostentation. So the higher the head wrap, the better, the more ostentatious, the more showy, which is why the bow, the tie is not tucked underneath the head wrap. It's a prominent part 
of the way that the head wrap is tied. And one thing that you see over and over again is that often women would wear head wraps and balance a hat on top of the head wrap. Another thing is um, most of these head wraps are made out of madras, um, which is a textile that was made in the Indian subcontinent, um, but was the textile of preference for head wraps for women in West Africa and the Caribbean. So all of these elements are important and you're gonna see over and over again in the portraits that are the focus of my research. This slide is just to show you the, the impact and reach of this particular dress practice, this um, circum-Caribbean, Afro-diasporic, African um, dress practice by women. Um, so the, the image on the left is from Colonial Suriname. Um, and she's wearing koto dress, which is, which is basically what I'm describing, but the word in, in Suriname is koto or koto misi. Um, so you see it in the Caribbean, in, in Suriname, in Dominica, like I showed you in American South and Louisiana, you know, Jamaica, Cuba, Colombia, et cetera. You also see it along the West African coast amongst, for example, um, senores, which is a word to describe mixed race women of color who form relationships with European traders and officials along the West African coast. So that the, the image in the middle is a senore and they, they dress very similar. And I would argue that they're sort of the point of inspiration for how many women are dressing in the Atlantic world. Um, they wore these, these high sort of conical head wraps often made in madras. They often drape themselves in sort of sumptuous um, fabrics, um, which is slightly different than how other women were dressing in West Africa, but they often sort of displayed their consumptive power through their ownership and wearing of textiles with the, which, which they draped their body with. The image on the right is from Europe. It's from uh, uh, an early fashion magazine in France in the late 18th century. But you can see that the, the figure um, in this, this, pic, this drawing is one um, wearing a necklace that's inspired by um, uh, chains of slavery. Um, so the you can see here it says collier on esclavage. Um, it describes um sort of the change that enslaved people wore, which were shaping how women, even in metropolitan France, were dressing. Um, and I'm going to talk more about that towards the end of my presentation. But now I want to jump into um, the portraits that sort of formed the nu nucleus of my research. So this is the first portrait that I analyzed in the chapter. Um, it's by an Alsacian artist named Francois Flashbein, who lived in New Orleans in the early 19th century. And the first thing that I want to draw your attention to is her head wrap, um, which is probably the most prominent accessory that she's wearing, it's el elaborately tied. Um, and, you know, thinking about the earlier part of my presentation, um, the, the Tignon law stipulated that women of color's hair had to be covered by a head wrap and it had to lay flat. So this is not a Tignon as described in the, that, that, that clause because you can see when her hair is not laying flat, it's actually quite high. And also our, our hair is peeking out the sides of the head wrap. So again, just to reiterate, reiterate a point that I made earlier in my presentation, this law that a lot of scholars have given a lot of importance to actually wasn't shaping how women of color were wearing. The way they were dressing played part of a larger Afro-diasporic tradition that started in pre-colonial Africa. 
this port this portrait is interesting for a number of reasons beyond what I just said. Um, it, one, it just shows you, I think it shows how ideologies are wrapped up in the, not only in the creation of artworks, but also in the preservation of artworks. Um, because um, in the 1970s, um, this portrait, which is in the permanent collection of the historic New Orleans collection, was restored by a conservator. And that conservator removed um, most of the lacy details along her collar because she believed that a woman of color would not have been able to afford such fine details. Um, I'm gonna go back to that point, but another point that I wanna bring up is um, the prominence of the head wrap, because if you look at what she's wearing, it's quite conservative, it's dark, it's almost barely visible. Um, and I think we're meant to focus on one, the head wrap, but also the luminance of her skin and the fine jewelry that she's wearing. So yeah, I think that's really important because the background is really plain. What she's wearing is really plain. It's the accessories that really pop. But going back to a point that I made earlier um, about the preservation of this work and the conservator removing fine details, that's actually not as unusual as it sounds. There's another example of this happening. This is a portrait um, from the same period, like the 1830s. And um, at some point, um, the owners of this portrait who, who were descendants of the white children um, in this painting removed um, the young black boy that's towards the, the right in the portrait on the right. Um, presumably, wanting to focus on the, the white sitters in the portrait. Um, there's been a lot of research done on this portrait. When I initially saw it, I thought all four children might have been related, and that he was a illegitimate child of the patriarch of this family. That's actually not the case. What I suspect is that he was, he was a, a live-in enslaved domestic, um, that um, the children took a liking to and they asked that he be included um, in the portrait. But it's a really curious work of art only because he looks so despondent. Um, normally when black figures are included within portraits of white families, whether it's a, a painted portrait or a photograph, um, they're made to be sort of engaged in the family unit but he sort of they form a triad and he's sort of outside of the family unit it's 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 really curious for a number of reasons but what i really want to focus us to focus on is just, and, and it's at some point in its history that the, the family remove um this young black and slave boy from the portrait so um it's important to remember that ideology is often wrapped up in the preservation of artworks and material culture. This is the second portrait that I analyze um, in my research. The name of this sitter, and it's actually the only identified sitter um, in my research, unfortunately. I'm in the process of trying to cover the identities of the other sitters, um, but her name is Marianne Celeste Dragon. And Marianne Celeste Dragon, um, is often thought about when, when you, if you Google her name, you will see that she's often associate, associated with an early Greek presence in the Americas because her father was Greek and she also married a Greek man. But she also was a, a woman of color. And her mother was a, a woman, a mixed race woman. And um, she was identified as such even in her lifetime. Um, so much so that her grandchildren were also identified as people of color and, and they were denied political office because of their mixed ancestry. Um, in any case, um, at the year that this work was created is really important because if you think about the Tignon Law, the 
Edith of Good Governance that had the stipulation against um, women of color um, wearing ostentatious hairstyles, you will see that in this portrait, um, Maria Celeste Dragon has her hair uncovered. Um, again, proof that the law was ultimately ineffective and that most women of color weren't wearing, weren't really um, living their lives um, by the rules set up by Spanish colonial authorities. Also, what's really interesting about this portrait is that um, she was someone who identified more so with her European ancestry, which you're seeing in this portrait. Um, she's not wearing a head wrap. She's wearing, a, wearing an Italian round gown. And when I look at this portrait, it, it often reminds me of this portrait um, of the Marquise de Pompadour, um, sort of at her dressing table, or they're both holding, you know, um, makeup brushes. Well, in, in the case of Mary so that's right on, it's a flower. Um, in the case of the Marquise de Pompadour, it's a makeup brush. Um, but I, I see a, a similar sort of self-fashioning, um, despite these two portraits being several decades apart, um, they, they remind me of each other. And it also reminds me that Marianne Sinestra Gong was sort of signaling her European ancestry, um, which is important because it highlights the agency of women of color who sort of shaped their identities. Most of the women that I focus on in this presentation were sort of signaling their Afro-Creole identity, but in the case of Marianne Sinestra Gong, she was identifying more so with her European ancestry. This is another really curious portrait. Um, as you can see, like the first portrait that I show you, the composition is really dark. Um, the sitter is wearing um, dark garments. The background is really dark. And the, the standout accessory is the head wrap, which is very showy, gold and green. And as you can see, it, it's, it's tied in a typically Aphrodite way but lots of folds and ruffles and the tie being a prominent um, front and center of the head wrap. Another really curious element is that the sitter is wearing, a, is not wearing, sorry, is holding a snuff box. Um, and she's sort of pin pinching her right hand and sort of partaking in snuff. Um, it's important to remember that tobacco was still a luxury item in the early 19th century. So many people chose to be painted holding this luxury item as a, as a symbol of their power um, to partake in the consumption of tobacco. This is another portrait that I spend a lot of time unpacking in a chapter. It's by Giacomo. Was an, another French painter who lived in New Orleans in the early 19th century. Um, probably the most well-known sort of portraitist in New Orleans in, in the early 19th century. Um, most of Jacquemont's sitters are identified. Um, most of them are um, wealthy, um, plantation-owning, enslaving, need whites. Um, so this is a really curious portrait um, because it's one, it's different than its typical sitters and also the, the identity of the sitter is un unidentified. Um, you know, there's, there's some curious elements um, in the portrait. For example, she does seem to be wearing a wedding wing and the edge of her chemise is embroidered with an E and a D, which might be her initials, it's probably her initials. I have gone through city directories um, looking for um, the names of women of color with an E and a D. Of course, there are hundreds. <laughs> um, so I haven't been able to narrow it down based on the initials. Um, and also she's wearing this off the shoulder chemise, uh, which wasn't unusual for women of color um, throughout the Southern Caribbean and Louisiana to wear. Um, another, well, the most important element for me, because we're focusing on head wraps, is the 
the elaborate red head, head wrap that she's wearing, um, which again, like any other portraits, um, the background is dark and she's wearing a, a dark skirt um, and we're really meant the, the, to look at um, the head wrap that she's wearing. Um, again, not covering the hair because you can see um, her hair is peeking out the side. You can see a curl here. And this is another portrait that I spent some time analyzing. Um, one thing that I mentioned earlier in the presentation is the importance of the color red, which you see in this portrait and also in this portrait. Um, it was sort of just like now, um, color red is a color that we associate with sumptuousness and luxury. Um, and I think that was true, particularly in this context um, in the early 19th century in Louisiana. Another important element, of course, is the Madras head wrap that she's wearing. You can see that the tie is um, really prominent and also that the head wrap is not covering her hair. You see bits of her hair peeking out of the sides of the head wrap. So again, it's not about covering the hair, it's about accentuating the hair. And this is the last portrait that I analyze in the chapter. It's this, the sitter in this painting is often identified as Marie Laveau, who's a famed voodoo priestess in New Orleans. There's actually two Marie Laveaux. Um, the first, the Marie Laveau, and her daughter, Marie Laveau, who's more famous. Um, unfortunately, this is not Marie Laveau. Uh, Marie, Marie Laveau, the second daughter, um, said that there was, there was never any paintings or photographs taken of her. Um, this is just an effort of people um, trying to attach our identity to the sitter. Um, again, you know, one thing that I think about in this chapter, which is why part of it is titled The Invention of New Orleans, is how a group of folklorists and travel writers sort of created a lot of um, myth and lore about New Orleans in the late 19th century. And dress practices are actually wrapped up in that myth-making process because they started identifying the head wraps that women of color were wearing as tenio, even though these women of color weren't using that word to describe the head wraps that they were wearing. Um, you see, so sources from the period often use the word mouchoir de tete, which is head wrap or head scarf. Um, but tignon is not a word that I've seen used into the late 19th century or early 20th century. So again, it, it's, it's, there's a lot of um, myth making, um, myth creation um, when thinking about the history of New Orleans. A lot of looking back and sort of creating a lot of lore about the way women of color were dressing. And in the process of doing this research, I came across a really another curious trend that sort of threw a wrench into my research. And I had to like rethink the argument that I was making. Because I identified a lot of portraits of white women also wearing these head wraps. And as I said earlier, head wrapping is a ubiquitous practice globally. Um, so just because someone's wearing a head wrap, you can't assume that they're appropriating Afro diasporic head wrapping traditions. But in this case, looking at the, the textiles that these head wraps were made out of and how the head wraps are tied, and the fact that, again, it's not about modesty because many of these women have bits of their hair poking out. Um, I suspect that there was a trend in the early 19th century for women to wear these head wraps. Um, and I think an important, another important element that I must point out is that most of these, most of these women are either in Southern Louisiana or metropolitan France. So they were probably influenced by the women of color um, that were dressing them or living in close proximity to them. Um, and so, you know, this is the early 19th century. Now we have a language to describe power and inspiration versus appropriation. But of course, this is the early 19th century. 
we're talking about a slave society. And so um, it was possible um, for these women to liberally appropriate the dress practices of women of color and receive no reproach or criticism. However, even though my, I focus on the late 18th century, early 19th century, this is also a trend that's carried over into the 20th and 21st centuries. Actually, before I talk more about that, I, I, I wanna talk about this particular head wrap, which I spent some time analyzing while I was a fellow in the Costume Institute at the Met. And I actually have a, a short video that I'm gonna play if it doesn't work, it's not a big deal. I can describe um, what I'm talking about in a video afterwards. This head wrap was worn by an ancestor in the area of the Jones. He donated the firm's extensive collection of objects and garments to the Met in 1911. James and his sign were the love of Lane, a wealthy young family of enslavers whose views reached back to the Dwayne Diana and whose land faces the street in the hand of Foley's son. According to museum records, the head wrap dates from 1823, a moment in which a new white woman adopted the practice of wearing across head wraps, a style and technique innovated by black women who was that of the Caribbean and the American South. 19th century portraits of white women with head wraps like this of Diana. Both an accessory and right and so associated with African and Afro diaspora fashion. The head wrap in the collection of Aston Institute is an example of this collaboration. Okay, I'm not entirely sure if you were able to hear that. Um, if not, it's not a big deal. Um, hopefully, you were able to read the, the captions. Um, but essentially, this is a head wrap that's in the permanent collection of the Costume Institute. Um, it was worn by an elite white woman. So it's just another example of what I'm describing, what I described earlier in my presentation of um, white women appropriating um, Afro-diaspora kid wrapping traditions. And as I was alluding to a little bit earlier, this is a trend that was carried over into the 20th and 21st centuries. Um, so on the Far left is an image from a, a recent Mark Jacobs collection. Um, Mark Jacobs actually wasn't inspired by Aphrodite's head wrapping traditions. He was inspired by an image of Sofia Coppola wearing a, a Pucci scarf. But when many people saw um, the models um, and how the, the, their head wraps were, were styled, they, they associated with Aphrodite's work head wrapping traditions, just to show you the, how complicated this issue of cultural appropriation is. Um, the image in the middle is a, a, a screenshot of a spread from a Life magazine feature on Doris Lee, who was an artist who did portraits of Black women in South Carolina. And so she, the spread has several um, other images like this, where you see her artwork on the left and her trying to replicate how they're dressed on the right. This image here on the bottom is, is another image from the French fashion magazine that I told you about early in the presentation from the late 18th century. But as you can see, the, this figure is wearing a head wrap, a Madras head wrap. Um, and the image from on the far right um, is from another French magazine. Um, this is from the 1920s. Um, the magazine's called uh, Gazette de Bonton. And you can see the caption says, Le Madras Jeanne the yellow madras. So here we have examples from the late 18th, um, 20th and 21st centuries. Um, so this is a, uh, a practice that encompassed, I guess, four centuries, which is crazy. So I'm gonna end it here. Um, these are just a few points just to conclude on. Examples of white women appropriating Aphrodite's head wrapping practices date back as far as the late 18th century. As an analysis of these portraits demonstrates, black women's styling choices were not dictated by legislation, rather by longstanding Aphrodite's traditions that predate and postdate the 1786 edict 
The ways in which Black women have styled their hair has a long and fraught history. So it's important to remember that Black women's sartorial agency shaped the law, not the inverse. So if you enjoyed this presentation, um, I would encourage you um, to follow. Have a, um, as Ashley mentioned in the introduction, have a, a digital humanities project called Fashioning the Self and Slavery and Freedom. This is the website for the project, but the project primarily lives on social media, um, on Instagram and Facebook. I'm even on YouTube and Twitter. I'm even on TikTok too, um, fashioning myself on TikTok. So um, if you're interested in Afro-diasporic dress practices, if you're interested in the visual culture of slavery and its legacy, feel free to give me a follow. And I am going to end here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Square, for your wonderful presentation. This is deeply inspiring and important research and helps uncover crucial narratives and stories that have too often been made invisible in fashion. My name is Brooke Graybick, and I'm the creative director of The Glass House and have the pleasure of hosting our Q&A with you today. So let's jump right into questions. Uh, why don't we start with this? Uh, what cultural meanings and functions did head wraps have in Africa in pre-colonial times and or prior to slavery in the US? This is a great question. And thank you, thank you so much for asking it. Um, I've done some research on the meaning of head wraps in Africa. And there's one interesting fact that I think people don't really realize or think about is that many Africans weren't wearing woven textiles on their head prior to contact with Europeans. Mm. It's kind of a, a garment of hybridity. Mm. Of course, Africans were braiding their hair and were wearing elaborate hairstyles, but the, the head wrap is something that you see often among mixed race communities along the West African coast. Mm. Um, so there's, for example, there's a, a group of um, women called the Senores, um, mixed race women who often partnered with white men in places like San Luis or Gore. And you always see them wearing head wraps. Um, so it's 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 sort of a, a symbol of um, it's African styling, but the 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 medium was actually from international trade. Um, mm. Europe or Asia. Um, mm. The the go-to textile for head wraps, I mentioned this in the talk, was Madras. Um, that's a textile that was innovated in the Indian subcontinent. Um, and so head wraps are actually, a, a, it's, it's, a, it's a sign of hybridity. It's also a sign of like sumptuousness and luxury and access to international commerce. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you look at um, images by travel writers who are uh, Europe, often, most often European travel writers who are traveling to West Africa in like the 16th and 17th centuries, you see African women sort of wearing very elaborate head wraps, the higher the better, almost mm -hmm. conical head wraps. Um, and you often see them sort of draped in woven textiles. And these textiles aren't necessarily um, textiles that are um, indigenous to Africa or West Africa. These are textiles that are often made in Europe and Asia. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, I want to get to the ostentation of head wraps later down the line in a next question and this issue of hybridity. Uh, next, let's um, talk about women's hair. Uh, women's hair across many cultures has long been a site of contention and anxiety, particularly curly hair and hair that's not pulled back, hidden or contained through an updo. Part of this anxiety is the way hair, and again, particularly curly hair, points to a woman's erogenous zones, her sexual agency, and her freedom. So historically, Western culture has feared women's hair let down or loose, especially in public, as a fear of women's agency. And that if she was unrestricted or unbound from these kind of patriarchal frameworks, um, in which her containment needed to be embodied by her contained hair. What is the dialogue here with head wraps 
women of color and hair as a site of cultural anxiety, particularly in the African diasporic cultures you look into? Great question. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think it all comes down to control and power, as most things in society. <laughs> yeah. But um, controlling someone's hair is a way of controlling them. I think about the Crown Act, uh, which is an, an effort um, to a lot of um. There's there's rules within the military that certain hairstyles, particularly black hairstyles like braids and dreadlocks, aren't allowed within the military. And there's there's a effort to um, do away with that bylaw and allow people to wear their hair however they best see fit. Mm -hmm. it, it, it comes down to power and, and control. I think about, I mean, this is broadening the conversation beyond sort of black hair styling or Afro diasporic styling. But think about like, you know, the Dobbs decision and the overturning of Roe v. Wade or a lot of the legislation against trans people that's being enacted right now. It's all about control. Mm -hmm. and, you know, part of, I think a lot of people think like, well, what do you care what I do with my body? <laughs> yeah. Like it's, it has no bearing on how you live your life. Like it shouldn't matter. But I mean, it's about power and control. And I think whether it's overturning Roe v. Wade, trans, anti-trans legislation, this colonial law that I look that I look at in the late 18th century, it's all about controlling bodies and about power. They, they looked at people and understood that there was a certain degree of power that they were exuding through control of their own bodies and they wanted to put sort of a stamp, tamp that down. Yeah, yeah. I love that and speaks to the agency that fashion has. You mentioned Marie Antoinette, who was of course known for popularizing the poof hairstyle in Europe. She also appropriated the use of cotton, of the cotton chemise, that one of the um, items that you showed in the painting, um, which she was scandalized for. And these styles came from colonial histories, uh, European women seeing the influence of uh, Caribbean and West African fashion. Um, at the opposite extreme of power dynamics, do you see any commonalities in sartorial meanings between the way head and hair decorations are being used by women in the late 1700s? What are the histories and dialogues between Mary, and Mary Antoinette being both revered and scandalized for her hair or her cotton chemise? and the African diaspora traditions we've been looking at with you today? I love this question so much. Um, and actually, I couldn't go into detail about this in the talk because I couldn't talk for two hours. <laughs> but I do talk about Antoinette, Mary, Marie Antoinette in, in the chapter. Um, I spend more time talking about Josephine Bonaparte mm -hmm. and her crew. Um, in French, they refer to Les Marvelleuses um, as a group of very trendy young women who um, their heyday was doing a directoire in the, the late 18th century. Um, and many of these Marvelleuses were born in the Caribbean. They, they came from Creole families. Um, and a lot of the way they were styling themselves became very trendy. So they also... Um, or a later version of the chemise, this sort of um, gauzy, diaphanous, patent chemise or shift dress. Um, and often in like in traditional fashion histories, um, they'll say that the, the influence was like um, neoclassicism, mm -hmm. they were influenced mm -hmm. by antiquity. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's untrue. I just think there are two things can be true at the same time. <laughs> I think they were also influenced by the way women were dressing in West Africa and the Caribbean. Because going back to our earlier conversation about like, you know, West African women sort of draping themselves um, in European textiles and textiles from Asia as a sign of like luxury and sumptuousness. Um, I think they looked, they were looking at the way these women were dressing particularly these Marvelous because they were born in the Caribbean. So they were surrounded by women of color. Women of color were, might even have been dressing them 
or in their household. So there was an intimate relationship between these women. Um, I think they were looking at how they were dressing in a, one, it's practical. Yeah. I mean, particularly if you live in a hot climate um, to wear cotton, it just breathes better than a woolen. But also it just became trendy, it became fashionable. So it's the way people started dressing at the turn of 18th century into the 19th century. So this sort of um, Regency, um, Imperial Waste look, I think was in, in part inspired by um, Afro diasporic styling. Mm -hmm. So there is a direct relationship between the way women like Marie Antoinette mm -hmm. and Josephine Bonaparte were dressing, which I think was in part influenced by um, Afro diasporic styling techniques. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, I love that. And I think um, the ways that women had agency in fashion, and that was so much, even with Marie Antoinette on the opposite end of the spectrum, um, really not having political power and political say as a woman, but showing that agency through the height of her hairstyles, kind of appropriating the phallus and, um, different kind of modes of ostentation in a very different context. And one thing I didn't say in my response is to talk about the head wrap because mm -hmm. that trend started in the late 18th century, but it carried over well into the mid 19th century of, of white women wearing head wraps in sort of the Francophone Atlantic world. Um, again, I think they were inspired by um, women of color who were wearing head wraps. One, again, it's practical. If, if you're in South Louisiana, or the Caribbean, you need some sort of protection for your hair. Um, but also it, it became a fashion item. It became very trendy to sort of wear these head wraps. And again, traditional fashion histories will tell you that they were influenced by um, the Levant or, mm -hmm. or Oriental fashion. And I think that's true, mm -hmm. but I think they were also influenced by um, Afro diasporic head wrapping. You point to the way that different media, such as public notices, paintings, and written accounts can contribute to myth making. What has your research process been like to uncover the narrative of enslaved people amidst a lot of historical media that's also created by those enslaving and in power? Yeah, I mean, this is the dilemma of the historian of slavery because um, the bulk of the material that I'm using to get at the experiences of enslaved people weren't made by people who were enslaved. I mean, it's a dilemma of anyone who studies any marginalized community, whether it be we, women or femmes or um, trans people, um, people of color, colonized peoples. Like it's, it's, it's something that we often encounter in doing the work that we do. And honestly, what you have to do is just read, and you, you, anyone who's an academic probably has heard this term before, but like reading against the grain, mm -hmm. reading the source in a way that it wasn't intended to be read, sort of, mm -hmm. of reading between the lines, like mm -hmm. gleaning new information from a source that was, might have been used to oppress someone. Mm -hmm. um, in my case, there's also a handful of sources that were created by enslaved people. Of course, enslaved people sometimes were artists, and many of their artworks survive in museum collections. Um, some enslaved people were literate and were able to um, tell their stories in slave narratives. Of course, that's also a mediated source because those narratives were edited because um, most publishing houses were owned by you know white people. Um, I also use um, uh, some sources called the WPA slave narratives which were created in the 1930s. So in the 1930s, during the, during the Great Depression, um, the, the federal government funded a project in which um, academics and intellectuals were paid to interview formerly enslaved people. This is the 1930s. Of course, most enslaved people, people who had, who had been enslaved were quite elderly by the 1930s. So there was an effort to record their stories um, before they died. And so it was a nationwide effort to record the stories of formerly enslaved people, the last generation of surviving 
um, enslaved, formerly enslaved people. And that's an amazing source. Anyone who's watching who wants to comb this source, please, it's vast. There's tomes, tomes of, of, of narratives by enslaved people that haven't fully been analyzed. Um, and also it's free and available online because it was recorded by or it's archived by the Library of Congress. So anyone with the internet connection can access it. And also it's a fairly, it is mediated because you know they weren't recording these sources themselves. Like there was a, a, um, an intellectual, uh, someone recording their stories um, and they often sort of edited these narratives. But considering this is, decades past the era of slavery there wasn't the fear of being enslaved yeah. um, so it's a fairly unmediated source um so i would encourage anyone to, to check it out um, it's, at the, it's on the library of congress website so there's a variety of sources that i use whether it be the wpa narratives that i just mentioned slave narratives i use a lot of artwork newspaper accounts but as you mentioned in your question most of these sources are um biased to a certain extent as all sources are and, and honestly it's it shaped in a lot of ways my vision of the world um i'm really that person when i when i read something i'm like who said that yeah <laughs> like i always want to take me to the primary source like i'm i'm a i'm a i'm, a, I'm such a critical reader yeah um so but i don't necessarily think it's always a bad thing yeah, and that's important, especially in our times, and will be interesting to see how this conversation develops with AI and, um, yeah, a whole other issue that we can get into. But on, on this note of um, mediation and media, um, you, you had said and showed in your presentation how ideologies are wrapped up in the creation and preservation of artworks, same in the authoring of works in you know, all of this that we're talking about. Um, I think the same can be said for social media platforms. I know that you're committed to sharing a lot of your scholarship online. How do you think about or negotiate these issues in terms of the ideologies that are wrapped up in these digital platforms for creation? I love this question. In fact, I think I want my second book project to be on the internet. Mm. I'm really interested in the digital blackness, mm -hmm. but I'm also interested, just to go back to your response, to my last response about AI. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in technology, but how technology is actually not that new. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of a lot of the the things that are sort of embedded in technology actually come from the 19th century. Yes, things come from things. It doesn't, doesn't just spring, you know, <laughs> out of nowhere. It's like several generations of people have been working on this technology, and so there's a lot of like old ideology that's built into the, into new technology. And I'm yep. really interested in the ways in which AI actually replicate existing stereotypes and prejudices. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. so that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. I, I hadn't even started right thinking about that book project, but it's something I want to think through in a future project. Well, um, I'm, I'm excited to read that book when it comes. And, <laughs> um, and, and I think I agree with you on the um, point of technology that um, often we think about technology as, you know, the advent of the internet or something, but, you know, many philosophers have pointed out the way, you know, technology is a doorknob, it's glasses, it's the tractor, and um, that there's a long history of technology, and specifically I'm thinking of Heidegger's writing on this, where he points to technology as um, something that always creates, is used to create more efficiency. And, um, but of course, they, he opens a whole problematic, which you're also opening, you know, in these types of media that create efficiency, what is also, what are the ideologies being promoted and what's getting lost and um, yeah, so much to delve into there. So uh, we'll have to have you back with <laughs> the next book. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, speaking of different historical, 
uh, influences and references. And um, I really appreciated in your talk like, the way you started your presentation, acknowledging the scholar and curator, Dr. Denise Morrell, and her practice as an inspiration to your work. Um, this resonates not only because of the content of your lecture, which teases out these different lineages and very complicated lineages of influence of the head wrap um, that was covered by a colonialist mythology, but also because as scholars, we work in networks of ideas and um, support our own research through utilizing, comparing, and contrasting and engaging with the work of others. So I want to ask you, what other works or experiences or histories in your own life helped you to form your interest in fashion history and influenced you towards your subject matter? Mm, I could spend an hour answering mm -hmm. this question, but I'm gonna try to keep it succinct. Um, I've always been a creative person growing up. I'm a double Pisces. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a believer in astrology. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a creative sort of imaginative person just by nature. It's always been part of my life. I haven't always pursued it academically. Um, when I first started my PhD program, I started as a scholar of slavery. And the fashion came later, at least on a, the scholarly end of things. At, at some point in the process of doing a PhD, I start. I I started a fashion blog. Remember fashion blogs when people used to blog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like you'd have like a a blog spot and you'd like post oh, yeah. your outfits. Now mm -hmm. it's more about social media. But before yeah. like social media really took off, people used to have you know little websites where they post their outfits, and I had one of those. And I, I was doing a PhD at the time, and it's kind of the moment where I started like being a critical fashion scholar, but also bringing in my training as a historian of slavery. It happened kind of organically. Like at some point I designed a course, the title of the course was actually Fashioning the Self in Slavery and Freedom. <laughs> um, and I sort of set up a Facebook page in tandem with the course that I was teaching with the idea that students would engage with the course material outside of classroom using social media. Mm -hmm. Fashion itself and slavery and freedom sort of took off as its own project, sort of a pedagogical project that lives online, like a, a digital humanities project. Um, so all these parts of myself just sort of, I just became integrating sort of organically. Um, I don't even remember your question. You, you asked me how. <laughs> um, just what are the influences in your own history that and kind of references things that led you to starting this work but i i mean you've answered it um but yeah i, I mean i could spend another hour to response. i mean i think another big influence is my upbringing um you know i come from an african-american family from south louisiana i'm a descendant of enslaved people so i was just interested in my own history in my own place in the world um, also, just being a creative person, being a lover of art and fashion, it just sort of, all these things just sort of worked out organically in a lot of ways. Um, but in terms of like concrete influences, <laughs> um, beyond Denise Morrell, who I absolutely love and is an inspiration, and I can't wait for her exhibition to come out um, next year at the Met, which is on the Harlem Renaissance. Mm. Um, other big influences on me, um, I'm a, I, I'm a big fan of the historian and artist Nell Irving Painter. Mm -hmm. She's a historian, wrote several books, taught at Princeton for a number of decades. And when she retired, she went back to school um, and studied art. And I was a professional artist. She wrote a book called Olden Art School about her experiences as a Black woman in her 60s at RISD. Mm -hmm. um, and I curated an exhibition of her artwork. So I'm, I'm a big fan of her. Um, to, um, Monica Miller, who's a literary scholar at Barnard, who wrote a book called Slaves to Fashion, is a really big influence on me. Tanisha Ford, another Black fashion scholar, is at the CUNY Graduate Center. Um, other big influences. Um, artists, 
I'm, I'm, I'm as much influenced by artists and designers as I am by scholars. Um, so I know artists like Elizabeth Columba is a really big influence on me. Nona Faustine, Fabiola Jean-Louis, um, the list goes on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great. How do you approach researching, writing on, and teaching the often complex issue of cultural appropriation? Yeah, this is a great question. Yeah, you know, if I, I use the word cultural appropriation like a match to spark a conversation. Mm. Every time you use the word cultural appropriation, people's ears perk up yeah. in good and bad ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the good way is that you grab someone's attention and they immediately have a thought about what you're saying. Sometimes before you even finish your sentence, they're like formulating their response to what you're saying. It's, it's that much of a hot button issue. Um, so I like it. I like that I can use it as a way to sort of attract the attention of an audience. Mm -hmm. Interesting. What I don't like about it is what I just said, is that people are already forming it, formulating their opinion about what you're saying before you even finished your, your response. The thing about cultural appropriation, and sometimes I don't even use the word because I think it's sort of been stripped of its meaning. Mm -hmm. I use other words like cultural exchange or cross-cultural inspiration, et cetera. What I like about cultural appropriation though is that there is, it does sort of get at the potential violence of those things. Mm -hmm. Like it's not always right. Yeah. <laughs> and I think appropriation sort of gets at that, like a, a harm has been done. Mm -hmm. um, but I think sometimes the conversations around cultural appropriation lack nuance. Mm -hmm. People are already judging something before they even sort of really fully unpack what's going on. Um, so I like the word for its ability to spark a conversation easily. You know, I'm very active on social media. So I'm always thinking about like, what's the YouTube catch caption like what's yeah. the first what's the first line of my video that's going to grab an audience's attention and cultural appropriation like you know kim kardashian yeah <laughs> people are already are already are already formulating a, a response to what you're saying um so that's what i like about it but i think sometimes social media isn't the best forum for complex nuanced conversations and so I'll start off using cultural appropriation and then I'll say, now let's really unpack what's going on. Like what's what's the dynamic that's happening here? Let's let's have a more complex nuanced conversation about this this dynamic. Um, you know, I don't use it in the chapter that I presented. Mm. Um, I use other words to describe what's going on because I think it's complex, you know. You know, white women wearing chemises and head wraps at the turn of the 18th into the 19th century. Can we call it a pro cultural appropriation? It's a little um, achronistic to a certain degree. Um, and also there were different conversations about power and cultural exchange happening at the time. And so I'm not ent entirely sure if cultural appropriation is the right word to get at that. Um, but if I were creating a YouTube video about my research, or Instagram Reel, or TikTok, 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 <laughs> TikTok. <laughs> I'm showing my age. <laughs> if I were creating a TikTok about my my research, I would use cultural appropriation because I know it would grab people's attention. Well, thank you so much uh, for this beautiful conversation today and for your presentation and um, I'm sure that our audience uh, has many more questions so I want to ask I know you teach uh, fant some fantastic classes at Parsons on fashion race and post-colonialism 
um, with wonderful syllabi. Um, for our audience members wanting to delve more into these subjects, what texts would you recommend them starting with? Totally. I mean, there's so many. Um, a lot of my syllabi are online on my website. So if, if you go to jonathansquare.com and then go to pedagogy, I post all my syllabi. That's a good start. Um, if you just want a, a book or a, a selection of books, I would say, um, I'll go to the scholars that I've already referenced. Mm -hmm. Monica Miller wrote a book called Slaves to Fashion. That's really seminal. Tanisha Ford wrote a book called Liberated Threads. She also wrote a book called Dressed in Dreams that I would suggest. Um, Nell Painter, Olden Art School, I think it's a great read. Um, I, I, I'll, I'd be remiss not to plug my own projects. <laughs> So um, I am in the process of writing a book manuscript right now, which should be out in 2025. Um, that's on um, enslaved people's dress, fashion and slavery. Um, I also am very active on social media. Um, I have a project called Fashion the Self and Slavery and Freedom that I mentioned. It's on on everything Instagram, Twitter. it's even on threads. Um, I also have another project called Rendering Revolution. That project is not just me, it's a, it's a, it's a group of us of scholars and it, that focuses on Haitian visual culture. It's on Facebook and Instagram. I have a new project called North Star, uh, which is more focused on making and embodied practices. Um, so it's actual garments that I'm constructing and creating narratives around, very similar to the Glass House in a lot of ways. Um, so if you if you're a fan of the Glass House, you might be a fan of North Star. Um, and just to go back to a question that you posed earlier about social media. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm conflicted about the use of social media. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm 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 very active on social media, but. Um, there are a lot of problematic ideologies that are wrapped up in social media. Um, so all that's to say, I'm very active on social media, but I, I don't use them uncritically. So. Yeah, yeah. What are your tools for kind of critically using social media? Like what, what does that mean to you? Good question. Yeah, every so often someone from Meta will reach out to me um, because I have a large following and, you know, they're always like trying to like mine their creators for more information on how to make the platform more effective. Mm -hmm. And they're always thrown off by me because most people use social media as a way to drive commerce, to sell yeah. more product. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not using it in that way. I'm using it as a pedagogical tool to spread yeah. information almost as an activist tool. Um, maybe I wouldn't take it at Farsi as an activist tool, but it is a way to sort of um, impart knowledge outside I'd of- I'd take it that far, yeah. Hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I'd say the way I, I, I use social media critically is to sort of throw a lynch into the algorithm in that way. Mm -hmm. Like it, social media is used to sort of run to mine to get more information about us in the effort in the effort to sell us more things. Yeah. Um, and I use it as a way to spread more information um, and as a educational tool. And of course, let me just say I am building my own professional profile. So I, I let me just be transparent. I am I am doing that as well, but also I I, I think of it as a tool, as a tool of liberation. You know, it's a, it's a way to sort of speak to a large audience an audience that might not have access to journal articles that are behind a paywall or who might not be able to go to Parsons or Harvard or NYU, like institutions that I've either gone to or taught at. Um, so it's a way of spreading more knowledge. Yeah, well, I'm so, uh, we're so in support of that at the Glass House. That's why we wanted to start this lecture series to see how we could you know continue to have these critical dialogues about fashion outside of these institutional structures so um 
I'm, I'm all for it. And I'm so happy that you could join us today and be just such an important part of this dialogue. And it's been a pleasure to have you and we'll look forward to seeing you again. Well, I'm honored. Thank you so much for asking me to present my research. And I'm such a fan of the work that the Glass House is doing. So um, we're both fangirls of each other. <laughs> okay, thank you, Jonathan. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.